Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Heather Mitchell, and I am here to introduce and welcome Antonio Damasio, who is vis visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Dr. Damasio is here to discuss his latest book, Self Comes to Mind, Constructing the Conscious Brain. It is time to debunk the long-standing idea that consciousness is separate from the body. What we think of as self is actually a biological process created by the brain. Consciousness is a dynamic, unpredictable faculty that is instrumental in defining and explaining who we understand ourselves to be. Dr. Damasio is a professor of neuroscience and the director of the USC Brain and Creativity Institute. His earlier books include Descartes' Air, Emotion, Reason, and the Human Brain, The Feeling of What Happens, Body and Emotion in the Making of Consciousness, and Looking for Spinoza, Joy, Sorrow, and the Feeling Brain. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Damasio to Microsoft. Thanks. Thank you. Let me start by apologizing for my um, voice. I have a horrible laryngitis. It's very painful. It doesn't taste good, although it was acquired in Japan last week and uh, doesn't taste of sushi at all. Um, so I'm delighted to be here in spite of the laryngitis and I will talk to you about uh, research on consciousness and on the self. It's always a pleasure to talk here. I miss the room where I've spoken before that had all the people logging in and appearing on the wall. This is a much bigger room, but I miss the little icons. Um, at any rate, uh, always a pleasure to come here and I don't think I need to disguise myself and make things easier than they are. I'll just make them very difficult because you guys can perfectly well cope with it. So here we go. Um, I thought I would give you a very brief summary of main ideas in this book. And the, uh, <coughs> the talk's name is Neural Self. Uh, and I'm trying to make here the immediate bridge between the self that we conceive of psychologically uh, which we all have a sense of, although very often not a perfect sense, uh, and the fact that it is neurally based, that it is something that is being generated by a living organism in the brain of a living organism, provided that brain is totally hooked and interactive with the body, without which none, none of this makes any sense. Now, it is because we have a self that we can make sense of consciousness. And consciousness, I have to tell you, and I say that in the book, is an incredibly treacherous term. Um, I, you know, I, I, I used to think that the best thing is not even to talk about consciousness because you're bound to get into a minefield and people start coming with their definitions of consciousness and their either lay view or scientific view, but highly uh, concerned with their field of study and it's very difficult to make a conversation work once you use those terms and yet there's no other way of doing it but confronting the issue and what I'm going to do is just define the same way that I do in the book define the term uh, and when I talk about consciousness I don't mean self-consciousness in a very broad sense of high-level human consciousness only and I don't mean consciousness in the very late-term sense of, for, that you, you will use if you talk about, say, uh, climate warning, warming uh, or climate change has, has finally got into the consciousness of Western societies, which is a metaphorical use of the sense. Uh, and I'm not talking about, for example, self-consciousness when I say that John got very embarrassed because Mary was staring at him uh, and therefore he got self-conscious, which again is a semi-metaphorical use. What I'm talking about is a process, a state of mind in fact, which is highlighted by three fundamental neural processes. 
one which is wakefulness, another which is mind, and another which is self. And of course, I better define for you what I mean by these three things. Wakefulness, I think, is very easy for you to follow because it's, of course, is exactly the kind of thing that you acquire when you wake up in the morning and the kind of thing that you give up for certain when you go to sleep. Um, mind, uh, we need to spend a little more time in defining, but I can give you a rapid definition from my perspective, which is the representation of objects and events present inside and outside the organism in both perception and in recall. And it's a very direct, simple, but I think actually a rather complete definition because it means that minds are about representing objects and about representing actions and events. And those actions don't need, and objects, don't need to be exclusively on the outside, which is the way they're generally taken to mean, but they can be inside your own body. This is very key. And they can be indirect perception. Right now, you obviously are looking at me, so you have in your mind representations of me visually and of me in terms of my voice. Um, but this could all be in recall. You could uh, later tonight be thinking about this and suddenly picture in your mind uh, the, the sight of me here at the podium or my horrible voice or both. Um, all of that is in fact constituting the mind which is flowing in time as a set of representations of many different sensory stripes. Um, and the currency of our minds is images. Uh, I will, I cannot talk about it right now, but our brains, the brains certainly of humans and the brains of many uh, species, in fact going all the way down to relatively modest species, uh, our brains have the capacity of making neural maps, which means that they can represent the constitution of objects topographically. And I'm not just talking about the visual constitution, but the constitution when you touch something and appreciate its texture or its shape, or the representation, for example, of the sound properties in a voice or in the kind of noises that an object makes. And neural maps, are that currency of our minds. And once neural maps are appreciated in consciousness, they can be properly called images. So you can say that minds are a flowing process of images, which are at heart neural maps generated by the brain of an organism that is interacting and moving about in the, um, in the environment. Now, uh, there was something missing at the bottom of that slide that says that feelings of the body are a particular class of images. And in keeping with the fact that I said that the representations that are in the mind correspond to objects and events both outside and inside the organism, I'm now adding this uh, little wrinkle that when you have images of your own body, some of those images can, be, can become feelings but they are, in fact, representations of body state, representations, for example, of pain or pleasure, or many of those fundamentals that are literally on the border of mind and the appearance of sentience, the appearance of consciousness. It's really the bottom rung of consciousness. Um, now, what about self, which was the second constitutive component uh, of the process of consciousness. In a very basic way, I can define it as the organization of images as a function of the homeostatic needs of the organism. Now, you will see that this definition is something that doesn't, is not traditional at all. Uh, and what I'm taking into account here is an evolutionary perspective. I'm looking at the the function of self as a particular organization of images. And I'm saying that the organization of those images is a function of something that is absolutely critical for the organism, which is organizing life, organizing the management of life according to homeostatic needs. And this is something that I'm going to introduce right now. It's something that 
some of you may ask uh, later on, and we can go into greater depth, and it's the question is, is as follows. Why is it that we have minds to begin with, and why is it that we have consciousness? Why is it that that prevailed in evolution? What's the advantage? And to make a long story short, the advantage is to generate a better regulation of life. And this is very important because very often people think of mind or self or consciousness as something that appears from the top down and is generated without any kind of connection to the fundamental problems of a living organism. And I think this is nonsense. I think that the only reason why something as strange and complex as mind and consciousness would have prevailed in evolution is if it would have a tremendously important role to play in inducing part of our survival or optimizing our survival and in great part as well aiming at something that we certainly at the human level all seek very actively which is well-being in other words we don't just seek to survive we seek to survive with well-being that's part of the uh, organization of life that each individual and societies create for themselves so the self in strict biological terms for me is this ability of organizing the images that are flowing in the mind uh, according to this principle of biological need according to the fact that the main problem that we face as individuals is the management of the needs of life management inside a living organism uh, we deal with that the same way that amoebas or, or bacterial cells and other unicellular creatures deal with. They have to manage life, they have to manage this life process um, in a way that is compatible with procuring sources of energy, incorporating sources of energy, uh, transforming them, uh, excreting waste products, uh, and guiding behavior so that it can be conducive to survival and eventually to well-being. And the big difference between those simple cells uh, and our very complex organisms, including the human organisms, is that in the simple cells all of the management has been prescribed by your genome. And your genome is telling you uh, exactly what to do in certain circumstances. So if something happens, if X happens, you're supposed to do this. But that is not conscious, that is something that the genome is setting for you and it was set by natural selection. And uh, the situation that we have is quite different in the sense that we now have a way of being aware of the fact that such regulation processes are occurring and we have a way of optimizing those regulation processes. And in relation to images, since I told you about neural maps and images and the constitution of mind, you may say, well, but why do we even have minds in the first place? And the answer is that when you have neural maps, you have a possibility of optimizing responses in relation to both the inside and the outside. So for example, if you have the possibility of representing a predator in great detail, you have the possibility also of responding to the presence of the, the predator uh, with a better response. Uh, likewise, if you have an opportunity in the environment, if that opportunity is better represented visually or auditorially or in terms of touch or smell, you have a possibility of generating a better response. So all of this hierarchy of incredibly complex processes in our brain have a very good reason to stay on. They have prevailed because once uh, there were organisms that presented that variety, those organisms would have been more successful, would have been selected, and therefore the brains that were so organized would have a possibility of continuing on in further generations. Now, um, let me just go back to say that so you have that self as organization of the mind, 
Uh, and then in later stages, because you can say that that first self is a sort of minimal self, something that we definitely share with lots of animals. Um, but what we normally talk about as self is more complex. And there I define it as an assembly of a neural surrogate of the organism toward which images are oriented, thus operating as a protagonist and perceiver. Because we all know when we talk about, say, myself or yourself, we're thinking about something more than just this organization of the mind to satisfy our needs of life regulation. We have something that, in the case of humans at least, also includes the history of our past, includes the anticipation of our future. It is something much more complex that eventually culminates in personhood and in identity. And that's a process that is much more complex. We'll get into that in a minute. So, this is to launch me in this division of the self into three stages the proto-self, the core self, and the autobiographical self. The proto-self and the core self is something that we share with numerous species. So, for example, uh, if you ask me if a fish or lizards, uh, or birds for that matter, uh, have proto-selves and core selves, I would say it's quite likely that they do. I cannot guarantee you because they will not tell us, uh, but for a variety of reasons that we can go into, they have, as a very likely possibility, not only minds, uh, which is fairly patent that they do, uh, but they have proto-self and core self levels, that is, minimal selves. What they tend not to have, except in species that are very, very close to us, like, for example, um, higher primates, uh, or cetaceans, or, or wolves, is an autobiographical self. And what I mean by an autobiographical self is a level that is more complex and that is built uh, gradually in a biological uh, system on the core self and on the proto-self, which takes into account not just the here and now, the moment that is being lived, but also what has come on, come on before as a narrative in your history and what we anticipate for the future. And on the anticipation of the future, I have to say that humans are quite particular and quite unique. We do, you know, we live constantly in a, in a permanent present that on the one hand looks at the past and on the other looks at the future that we have planned and that we have aspired to, but that we have committed to memory. So therefore we are we are caught in between past and present, uh, except that that past and present change all the time, because right now we all have 15 minutes more than we had when this whole lecture started, and there's already a past that was present 15 minutes ago. Uh, and there's more that is being incorporated moment by moment as we move uh, into the future. Uh, let me just say that it is out of the autobiographical self that we generate most of the things that we hold true and dear in terms of our humanity. So uh, I think the ability to generate an expansion of memory, of uh, expansion of reasoning, uh, the force to generate language, and eventually the forces that led to creativity they all came out of the presence of the autobiographical self. And when we talk today about the instruments of culture uh, with which we navigate our social life, uh, those would not have been possible had we not developed an autobiographical self. And it's fairly uh, uh, obvious that the species that don't have an autobiographical self or don't have much of it have not had the, the possibility of generate, generating a culture, whereas we have precisely because we expanded all these other functionalities in a very rich way. So, um, let me just say that this first stage of the proto-self uh, actually is uh, contrary to what even myself used to think about 10 years ago, uh, brought out from the operations of the brain stem, as far as I can see now, and 
it is, uh, of course, when you think of the brain, you very often think of consciousness and you consider the cerebral cortex, which is easily the most distinctive aspect of the human brain. And many people, including myself for a very long time, thought, well, it's out of this cerebral cortical mantle that we're going to generate this amazingly complex process, which is consciousness and the self that really gives the mind the conscious level. Well, my view right now is that that is only true for the very high levels of self, the one that I call autobiographical self, and that the proto-self is actually being generated out of the brainstem here. Now, this may sound uh, quite controversial, and some people may be a little bit uh, annoyed at this, because this part of the brain, the brainstem, actually is extremely similar in design to the one that you can find in reptiles. So a lizard uh, or a frog will have a brainstem that is of the same model. So you can say, well, so are they likely to have anything like our consciousness? And the answer is, of course not. They, they, they are conscious in kind. They have mind processes, they have conscious processes as far as one can ascertain. Uh, but it doesn't make any difference because what we are talking about in the human consciousness is a combination of what goes on here in rich dialogue with what goes on in the cerebral cortex. So what I'm saying is not that human consciousness comes straight out of the same brain stem that exists in reptiles. I'm saying that comes out of a particular way of wiring the brain stem of human, but which is in the reptile model, with a cerebral cortex that is hugely different from that of any other species, and of course much larger in capacity as well. Uh, and the, what I'm talking about, so the, the location of course is here, as you can see, and what I'm talking about is this region over here that is particularly important, and that is the tegmentum of the a brainstem, particularly at the level of the midbrain. Uh, and it is very important to uh, know that uh, we have quite a lot of information about what this part of the brain is doing. You know, I'm not just dreaming about this and looking at these brains and uh, sort of uh, bringing ideas to you. Uh, we know that when you damage this part of the brainstem in front of the red section, you actually do not alter consciousness at all. But when you damage this part of the brainstem behind it, the one that is in red, you do alter consciousness quite severely. In humans, for example, you end up in states like vegetative state or coma. Uh, whereas here, you end up with something called locked in. And you also know that when you do the damage lower than this, you actually do not alter consciousness. So there is quite a lot of selectivity in terms of the parts of the brain that are related to consciousness or not, and this operates at the level of the brain stem and operates at the level of the cerebral cortex as well. Now, what is really fascinating, and I think for people like you who are, uh, at least on occasion, interested in circuitries, uh, is that we're now learning more and more about the circuitries that are contained in this small part of the brain stem. And it is quite a, quite a world. And I've just marked some of the key, key players here. One, which is the area postrema, another the nucleus tractus solitarius, another the parabrachial nucleus, another the periaqueductal gray, the superior colliculus, the hypothalamus. And you see the levels at which they are, midbrain, pons, medulla. Now, the critical issue, functionally speaking, of this region is that it is located totally between the body proper and the cerebral cortex. And the main function of this region, traditionally, in terms of the accounts that people have offered, is that this is the conduit for signals from the body proper to the cerebral cortex. So, signals from everywhere in the body uh, whether we're talking about, say, the viscera, uh, 
or about the chemistries in the bloodstream uh, or about the muscular system go through this region in order to get to the cerebral cortex and constitute representations in the cerebral cortex. Now this is sort of the traditional view. The view that is becoming more and more uh, entrenched now is that not only is there a connection upward to the cerebral cortex, but there are con multiple connections downward to the multiple regions that offered input to the brain. So rather than having something which connects unidirectionally, you have something that connects bidirectionally where signals go up and signals return. But then there's something even more important, and that is that each of these regions not only receives signals, but also transforms signals, so it can offer something additional to what has been conveyed. And each of these regions have the possibility of responding to the body and have the possibility of interacting among themselves. So what you have is a connectivity where you have massive recursiveness in the components and you have massive recursiveness in relation to each component in the body. So one of the things that you will find in Self Comes to Mind is an idea that this puts the traditional view of the relations between body and brain in a somewhat different footing. And my footing is that I think that the traditional separations between body and brain become extremely problematic when you look at this organization. It's almost as if there is no possibility of drawing a sharp border between body and brain because, because body constantly gets represented at all of these levels and these levels have the possibility of responding to the body. And I want you to think that this is a very unusual situation. For example, when I send now, for example, with my being here, give you the possibility of representing me visually in your visual cortices, there is no way that your visual cortices are going to have a way of responding to the origin of this neural map, which is me standing here. However, when my body or any of our bodies sends a representation to the brain, the brain has a possibility of modifying the very representation that was sent in. This is completely different, completely asymmetric in relation to all the other processes. And I think that is one of the, uh, you know, if, if this alone would get people to think about a different way of relating body and brain, I would be very happy and I would consider the book successful because that's one of the points. Um, and just to say that my current thinking is that this is the level not only at which you generate the proto-self, but at which you generate some of the most fundamental feelings of our entire organism, which I call now primordial feelings. And what do those feelings give you? Those feelings giving, give you a direct <coughs> online representation of what is going on in the body and give you the direct information that there is a living body in your organism, that there is existence, and it gives you the flavor of that existence along a range that at one extreme has pleasure and at the other has pain. And that is what I call primordial feelings. Now, I have to tell you that in the past I have thought, and I was partially correct, that feelings, for example, feelings of emotions, would be generated in a structure called the insular cortex, which exists, of course, at cortical level and which is represented here. This is a, an MRI and through a transparency we're getting from the outside to a deeper level at which we see the insula in all its glory and this is a structure that you see here. And sure enough, we have very good evidence that this idea, which I presented some 15 years ago, uh, is correct, that the insula is involved in generating feelings of emotion. So if you are happy or sad or angry or compassionate, if you are uh, watching pornographic movies or drinking wine or you are uh, undergoing the action of drugs of abuse or of withdrawals uh, of drugs, 
the insula is responding very actively and there's no doubt that the insula is a very strong platform for feelings at cortical level. But the point that I want to hammer in is that this smaller structure within the brainstem is actually the first platform for such feelings and that everything that is happening in the world of the brainstem, which is small but incredibly complex, is then being re-represented at the level of the insular cortex. Okay, now uh, the second stage, and I want to come as close as possible to the end of the story, the second stage of that self that is so critical to generate our minds is the core self. And for me, the core self is generated as a pulse, sort of moment by moment. So for example, uh, when you as an organism have an interaction with an object, suppose each of you right now, and the object which happens to be me, object and event because I'm talking at the same time, that interaction is going to modify the fundamental primordial feeling state that is being generated in your organism. And that modification is going to be made because, for example, right now I am talking, I'm moving, and all of these different movements are generating changes to your organism because your brain is picking up on movement, on sound, on visual impressions, and so forth. Not only that, there is a constant reaction at emotive level to whatever is going on outside the world. You may not be terribly aware of that uh, emotive reaction, and that's a good thing, but it's there, and there are constant reactions because in anything that is said or heard, anything that you see, anything, any idea that you process is going to have an emotive component, is going to modify the state of your emotional reactivity. So your organism in relation to any object or event is changing constantly. And it is in the relationship that you establish between your organism at state zero and your organism at state one after that change has been accomplished that you generate this very special relationship <coughs> which is going to be the source of the core self. Um, and you know you have an object that acts on the, the proto self at a variety of levels and that modifies primordial feelings that in change uh, in turn generate a variety of processes that are too long to explain now, that include perspective, feelings of knowing, a sense of ownership and agency, <coughs> and that eventually creates saliency for the object. Is that, that is how you create the core self. <coughs> now, the last stage, which I refer to, is the autobiographical self, and that occurs <coughs> when all the objects and events that are in our autobiography uh, generate pulses of core self, which are subsequently link in, linked into a larger coherent pattern. And what I'm talking about here is the following. If I now, you know, I could be asking you <coughs> to look at a variety of pictures that would have nothing to do with your history and you would simply, simply process them at a minimal self level or at a core self level. <clears throat> but if I would turn to you or to one of you individually and would start asking you <coughs> about who you are and what you have been living through before and where you were born and what, how do you decide to have your career, you would very rapidly switch into a mode that is the mode of autobiographical self. <coughs> I'm sorry, let me try to stop this. And what you would be doing then is generating very rapidly 
an evocation in memory of components of your past narrative, of your past biography, and giving each of them a pulse of core self and integrating them into a vaster canvas, which is the one that has to do with your narrative, your biography. And it's no longer about the here and now, but rather about how each here and now is put in the perspective of past and future. <coughs> I'm going to skip that and I'm going to, in order to see if I can get to the end without breaking out completely, I'm going to just tell you about two different spaces in which we organize this autobiographical self. And obviously, when we think about, for example, our past, uh, when we think about our history, we are creating representations, generating representations uh, in our minds, and those representations can appear in any uh, sensory system, and they will appear in terms of brain structure, in, for example, uh, auditory cortices, like for example here, or in visual cortices, like for example here, or in somatosensory cortices, like there. But in order for those representations to appear at that level, it is necessary that they are guided by a system of memories that will allow those representations to be formed. So if I ask you, where were you born, or when did you make your career choice, which is your current career choice, you will need to bring back memories that are from way back. Where are those memories held? <coughs> and the answer is that it is in a very different space. It's a space that includes, for example, the parietal cortex, the temporal cortex, <coughs> the frontal cortices, and it is there that you have <coughs> the entire machinery with which you have coded and recorded <coughs> those memories. I'm sorry, I cannot continue, but if you give me a minute, you can ask me questions and I'm going to try to answer. <coughs> For those of you who come late, I apologize that I have a very bad laryngitis and there's nothing else I can do other than drinking tea. <coughs> so. Um, Yes, ma'am. Do you have um, a perspective on... I haven't read your book, so I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. I haven't read your book, so I'm not sure if you have a perspective on Bruce Lipton's view of... Um, on what? I'm sorry? Bruce Lipton. Have you read your book? Um, no. I believe. So what I'm curious to know is, do you believe that um, basically our genes are what they are and that we can't change them? that we cannot change our genes. Well, it's true that we cannot change our genes uh, immediately as sort of as you go. <coughs> but it's not true that, uh, for example, the cultural effects that we create will not change our genes. For example, I discuss in the book something quite interesting is that human beings created the dairy industry. It didn't exist. It was not created by our genes. It was created by our, uh, by the fact that there was agriculture and there was farming, and it was discovered that you could harness certain products and create dairy products. Well, at the beginning, people reacted very badly to dairy products because our genome did not have the provision to metabolize dairy products. Well, it so happens that today lots of people are born with mutations that allow you to metabolize dairy products. That is something that has happened very rapidly 
over periods of thousands of years, which means a very limited number of generations, not a period of millions, let alone billions of years. So it is not 100% true that we cannot change our genome, except that we don't change it from one generation to the next. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, if I heard you right, at one point you were discussing a single-celled organism, uh, and you said it's, it doesn't have uh, consciousness because its behavior is deterministic. Uh, and is there a connection between the determinism of an organism's behavior and whether or not it's conscious and, 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 and has this touch on the question of free will and, and is that something that neuroscience can give us an answer to? Well, here's how I would put it. Uh, it's perfectly clear that if you're dealing with a bacterial cell or an amoeba, what you have <coughs> is an organism whose life regulation is entirely controlled by the genome. It's an environment, it has been well adapted, and it works perfectly fine. It's, you know, very successful organisms, extremely numerous. By the way, we have more bacteria in our bodies at any moment than we have cells that are actually components of our bodies. And that's because they're so successful and they're doing a lot of very nice, interesting jobs for us too. So they're sort of extension of our bodies. But there's very little freedom there. In fact, you could say there's none. The bacteria will do, by and large, or the, the other cells, singularly will do, by and large, what the genomes tell them to do in a certain circumstance. What we have that is very new and remarkable is that because we are so complex, we have invented these tools of culture. For example, moral systems, justice systems, uh, social and political organization, uh, the arts, religions, science, technology. <coughs> All of this play a homeostatic role, but what is interesting is that there's an element of freedom in that they are, they don't have to be in a certain way yet. They, there's a, a degree of freedom that is caused by the fact that they were decided upon when a number of individuals with their own selves, their own consciousness, their own perspective on the world got together to operate at a, a certain new level. And this is, of course, the creation of culture and civilization and there is a, a remarkable degree of freedom. Now, of course, do we have all the freedom? No, because we're still being controlled in good part by the genomes that make our organisms function in a certain way and we cannot abandon that. So you cannot touch that part of the, you know, that's a closed system. And it's, or it opens only very gradually over generations. But we can operate at this other level within a certain measure of freedom. So I think that consciousness at the highest level, by bringing on the emergence of culture, has been responsible by giving us not only knowledge, without which we would have no clue as to our existence or the existence of the world or of others, but it has given us a measure of intervention in the entire system of nature, uh, which can be either for the good or, or for the worse, of course. It depends on how we, with some freedom, will guide it well or not. Thank you, that's a very good question. Okay, one here, and then one there. I'm interested in your perspective on uh, complex machines like robots, which certainly map their surroundings, and which arguably have a representation of their own selves quote-unquote, in, in, in those maps. So would you attribute to them a certain measure of either of your, any of your three layers of self and hence consciousness? Excellent question. Did you hear the question in the back? So um, that's a wonderful question. I deal a little bit with it in this book. And the answer is that uh, sooner or later there will be machines that will have actually something like selves and consciousness in, the in all the senses uh, 
that I uh, outlined here. If your question is, however, will they, those machines, experience consciousness the way we do, my bet would be that they will not, unless you make their bodies exactly like ours, which would be, of course, an absurdity. Why would you? And besides, you couldn't, because it would be so much more complex than you could in a much more direct machine. However, those machines will have certainly a level of proto-self, but a level of proto-self that is not generating primordial feelings, <coughs> or at least not our primordial feelings. It's generating the primordial feelings of that machine, which don't have to be like ours, because our feelings are related to the state of our flesh. And those machines don't have flesh. They have whatever hardware you create for the machines. In those machines, what counts, in fact, is all the software with which you animate whatever hardware it is. And in humans, in living creatures, in general, it's both. The software is written in the hardware, and the two count very, very strongly. The other thing that is very important, <coughs> and this I talk about in the book, <coughs> um, is the following. When you create one of those robots, you, you, you have a body where once you build it as an engineering object, you, you have a very small risk of disease and death. You have a risk of malfunction, but you don't have a, a risk of disease and death in any way like that of, say, a human body. Why? Because our body is made up <coughs> of trillions of single organisms called cells, each of which has its own genome, has its own life cycle, and has its own risk of disease and death. There's no such thing in the body of the robot. That changes the game completely. And it's something that is not normally appreciated. One at the back. In your world, in your perspective, what is the biggest unknown or the biggest mystery? It's not just one, and I, I, I wouldn't even tell you about the biggest because I don't know what the biggest is. I think there's so many. Uh, for example, <coughs> I tell you what I, what I don't know for sure and I would like to know. At what level does feeling begin? We know, for example, that in order to construct a map <coughs> that can represent me in your brain, you need to have certain small circuits that are hooked up in larger circuits and then hook up in a map, say, in the visual cortex. We know pretty much how that functions. <coughs> so in a way, you can talk about a sort of proto-cognition that begins at very low level in the operation of single neurons. Is there an equivalent in terms of proto-feeling? Proto Is each neuron already endowed with an ability to feel? In which case, the feelings that we have of, say, pleasure or pain are sort of scaling up through the structure of those proto-feelings then emerging into a big time, large scale operation, or not? Or does it come, for example, at the level of the brainstem? That's a very important question. And we're nowhere uh, at the point of giving the answer. In fact, something that I present as a question, <coughs> and I have to tell you that when I, when I articulate this problem, people look at me and they think I'm coming from the moon, that I'm crazy. But I don't think this is crazy. This is absolutely essential if we're going to understand how this works. OK? OK, let's see, organize this. I think there was one other in the back, and then we move to the front. OK, switch to you. Herbert Mead wrote quite extensively. I'm sorry? Herbert Mead, yes. the American psychologist, yeah. Yeah. he defines self more as a social phenomenon. In his view, self does not predate 
the, the, uh, the uh, formation of society. Yeah. How would you contrast your view? <coughs> By saying that for me it does involve, it does start much earlier. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a tradition. Of course, if you start from psychology or from sociology, uh, there is a tendency to start at that very high level and work from outside in. But if you start at the level of a cell, say, say if, you, if you deal with something like an immune system phenomenon, the immune system is constantly recognizing self from non-self, in the sense that it recognizes an object from another object and responds accordingly. <coughs> so um, I think that I would start very early, as I do, and then work my way up to the social level. The social level is generated out of many autobiographical selves. But in fact, it can even start earlier. For example, there's plenty of evidence that groups of bacteria can behave socially. Groups of bacteria can fight for territory. Or they can cooperate, depending on the state of resources and on how things are in the environment. So these notions, I think it's very foolhardy to keep them only at one level. I think in all likelihood, you can find precursors all the way down into cells, if not molecules sometimes. Okay, um, who wants to be the last? <laughs> okay, I had two questions. One is, when does consciousness start? Not at the proto-consciousness level, but the core consciousness. So when in development does it start? And the second question is a bit different, but is there a um, neural basis for religion? Because regardless of which culture or society you're in, there's always the tendency for humans to create religion. So is that, does that have a place in the mind? Okay, so you want to know when consciousness starts at the level of a human being? Yeah. Very good question, but nobody knows the answer. Uh, chances are that a newborn has <coughs> a proto-self and is on the way to developing very rapidly a core self and by H2 there's already the beginnings of an autobiographical self being generated. Your question on religion is very interesting. I think there is a, definitely a neural basis for religious feeling. For spirituality. Yes, and for spirituality. And it has to do with the fact that, uh, of course, it can only occur in humans. It can only occur in humans because you need to have a very robust sense of self you need, to have a, you need to have had a sense of loss and a sense of question regarding the universe in order to try to generate answers for those questions. And a lot of those questions uh, appear in the form of religious thinking that precede and predate a lot of the extensive developments, of course, of science that have given other accounts of the universe, okay? Sorry about this, folks. There's nothing I can do. Thank you. I think I'm going to...